you are currently witnessing many AIs training to play a perfect game of Snake. It was a long journey getting to this point, especially because I made all of it from scratch, and I would like to share it all with you. In this video, I will cover how I designed the AI, how I created a custom version of Snake to complement the AI's design using deep reinforcement learning, and how you might have naturally discovered these insights on your own. Additionally, I will cover the AI's training process in Snake, final results after the training, as well as future potential and challenges to expand this project into other games like Valorant or Minecraft. First, let's start with the foundation of the project, the AI. Many videos have already covered the basics of AI, and I plan on building off of them. The inspiration for my AI architecture came from one of the best open source language models out there, Llama from Meta except I ripped out almost everything. And this is what I was left with. Basically, the difference between a basic neural network that you will see in many videos and the model left over by my changes is the activation function and the addition of residual connections. In short, these changes improve upon the downfalls of vanilla neural networks, and I will cover them in more detail in the later half of the video. Now that you know the AI architecture, let's work out the model's inputs and outputs. Unlike most Snake AI videos that you may have seen that raycast where things are in eight directions or some cheap tricks like that, I want to build something that can generalize to other projects in the future. My AI will need human vision. Of course, cheap tricks are not bad. Some of the best results can only come from very hacky techniques. So for this project, I'll do the best of both worlds. I will provide the full board as it is, but scale it down into one number per tile. For those of you who know your stuff, I won't be using a convolutional neural network head in this project. I'm still looking into better and simpler alternatives that work with residual connections like vision transformers. But that is besides that fact. The game plan now is the model will take in the board as input and output the direction it would like to move in using probabilities. This part is called the policy. Instead of saying, I wanna go up, it will say, I wanna go up 100% of the time and 0% for the other three directions. Additionally, the network will output a value score. This is the value head, which is used in the actor critic reinforcement learning algorithm I will be using. Basically how this algorithm works is you see the board and make a value score, like how good this board is. Then you move, see a new board, and make another value score. How good your move is depends on the difference between these two value scores. For example, we are here and let's say we have a value score of zero. Then you go right and you see the new board, resulting in you giving it a value score of one. Now, we know that our value score increases after we make that action. So we should do that action more often by increasing the probability we take that action. Yippee! In terms of gameplay, uh, due to some consideration for simplicity, I won't allow the snake to die if it hits the border or hits itself. This makes it possible for the snake to trap itself and remain stationary for the rest of the allocated sequences in a training step. This can be fatal if it is just one AI playing at a time, so I ran 1024 of them at the same time. This means that a small portion of the snakes will be trapped, but a majority will learn other things in different scenarios. Now that I am done yapping, let's look at the AI's training journey.
A few moments later. As you may recall at the start, I made two distinct changes in the AI. Let me do a quick recap of why I chose these two changes to improve over the basic neural network, because for many people, the basic neural network should perform pretty decently. The most important change in this project's success is the residual connection, and to help you understand why, let me tell you a short story. I had two different tasks that I wanted two separate AIs to learn. The first task is a simple binary addition, while the second is a harder binary multiplication. We start small and use a simple two hidden layer neural network to train on both tasks. You will see that the first task is solved perfectly, while the second does less good. So let's increase the layers and the layer sizes. As we increase these parameters, you will see the second task does better and better but demonstrates diminishing returns, while the first task does worse and worse. This seems to be counterintuitive. Shouldn't the larger neural network at least perform the same on the simpler task? You might be wondering why this happens. I am not too sure myself, but I have some theories. First, due to how neural networks are initialized with random weights, it is possible that the outputs of layers deep into the network will be more and more closer to zero leaving no patterns for the training step to grasp at. Because of how backpropagation functions, I believe it has all to do with each layer providing some patterns for backpropagation to use. This is probably why many researchers have found residual connections to solve this problem. Residual connections add the output of the last layer to the current layer's output, allegedly providing some variability to grasp at. Allegedly. With residual connections, the more layers you add, performance on harder tasks increase while performance on simpler tasks usually stay the same. 
The second important change I made to the basic neural network is a switch from the traditional ReLU activation function to a swig loop activation function. I made this change for two main reasons. The first is speed, and the second is improvement in performance, both massive wins for AI researchers. To understand how SWIGLU provides performance gains, we will need to understand how ReLU works with residual connections. You see, residual connections just add the output of the past layer into the output of the current layer. Additionally, ReLU always returns positive numbers. Do you see the problem? The combination of residual connections and ReLU will always result in the neural network producing a positive number of increasing magnitude as you go down the residual stream. Big positive numbers are very bad in training because the AI either explodes or learns to produce very small positive numbers which doesn't encourage quality or fast training. To get around this, many people just add another linear layer after the ReLU so that each layer block can learn to output negative numbers. This results in two separate matrix multiplication operations for each layer block. SWIGLU, on the other hand, allows you to return negative numbers with one layer operation at double the size. It works by computing the traditional outputs as well as another set of gating values for each corresponding output. The gating value gets squeezed between 0 and 1, then multiplied to the output. So you might be thinking two matrix multiplication operations versus one matrix multiplication operation at double the size. What's the difference? The difference is we are running these operations on the GPU. GPUs love doing the same task at massive scales, so running an operation at double the size will usually perform better than running two of them one after the other. Additionally, SWIGLU is basically ReLU, but the gating is variable. In the worst case, it can learn how to ReLU. However, in most cases, any variable gating function performs better than non-variable gating functions. I hope you enjoyed the video and stick around for my next project.